All right, so we've got our 2, 4 hexadiene, and we want to understand what's really going on. Now, in the previous video, I talked about where pi bonds come from as a result of molecular orbital theory. But when we go to conjugated dienes, trienes, whatever, we're going to find that this simple idea of pi bonding really stops making sense, particularly in the context of molecular orbital theory, which is what it's trying to borrow from. So let's again, let's draw back our psych, let's look at our hexadiene before we put the electrons in. Now, an important aspect of molecular orbital theory is that the number of molecular orbitals equals the number of atomic orbitals. So the number of molecular orbitals you can generate equals the number of atomic number, atomic orbitals that you start with. So if we're going to use this, we're going to draw from molecular orbital theory and bring it back to Lewis theory, try to actually apply it. If we've got four p orbitals that we're using to generate our diene system to create our pi bonds, then we have to generate four molecular orbitals out of them. How do we do it? Well, we actually kind of use this SPDF progression. So there's one S orbital, so there's one S type molecular orbital. There are three p orbitals, so they're up to three p looking um, molecular orbitals, and 5D, so forth. Symmetry is what's going to set the number of actual S-like, P-like, D-like, and F-like orbitals. Now I know I'm throwing a lot at you right now. This is going to—I'm I'm laying a framework. Trust me. So we can't—you're not at a level to know the predictions. But here, first thing is we always form an S-like orbital, S-like molecular orbital. What is an S-like molecular orbital? It has no nodes in it. There's no breaks in the electron density. So we would say that this puts all four p orbitals in phase, meaning that if we line them up in a row and add them together, we get one continuous electron density. So our lowest energy orbital here is going to be the addition of all four. And if I were to draw that out, I would have something that looks sort of like this weird long... snake-like p orbital. So, this is the first molecular orbital predicted by molecular orbital theory based on these four. What are the next two? Well, we can have one where there's a plane running between these two, and this will be our p-type. So in our p-type, we have one break in the electron density in the molecular orbital. So we have the first two in phase, but the second two are in a different phase. They're in phase with each other, but they're not in phase with the other two. This is going to be higher in energy because we create this break in the electron density. What about above it? I'm going to leave these here just so this way you can see like these are the base energy of the p orbitals. Well, we can have one where we've got a d-type. We've got two breaks in the electron density. So our d-type is going to look like this. We have p orbital here and p orbital here looking like they're unchanged with these two interacting. Now our highest energy one is going to be the one that's going to look f-type. And then this f-type, all three of these are out of phase. So if you draw it, got up, down, up, down. Now, the other thing about the electrons, we have to take, another thing about molecular orbital theory is we have to take all the electrons we started with as well. So each of these p orbitals contains one electron. Now, like atomic orbitals, we can hold up to two electrons in each molecular orbital. So if we've got four here, we're going to end up with two electrons in this phase and these phase. These are going to be our bonding, and these are going to be our antibonding. So this is the picture that's really predicted by molecular orbital theory if that's what you're actually going to use. Now, again, you can kind of see when we draw our hexadiene, we just show the individual pi bonds and that's it. This is really what's going on. We actually have two pi-like bonds, pi-like orbitals. One that has a continuous electron density among the four carbons, 
and one where it's kind of broken into two gaps. So this is more what we'd expect to see by Lewis theory. But there's an important implication in this, that we're no longer, particularly with the lowest energy orbital, no longer constraining these electrons to be between individual, two individual atoms. They're actually spending a lot of the time spread up among the four atoms. And this is going to give rise to electron mobility. The electrons can actually move from carbon to carbon to carbon along the molecular orbitals that are generated. So we're getting closer and closer now to understanding how aromaticity falls out from molecular orbital theory and how we're going to retroactively apply it back to Lewis theory.